Chapter twenty five of the Alhambra A Series of Tales and Sketches of the Moors and Spaniards by Washington Irving. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Chapter twenty five Legend of the Rose of the Alhambra or The Page and the Gerfalcon. For some time after the surrender of Granada by the Moors, that delightful city was a frequent and favorite residence of the Spanish sovereigns, until they were frightened away by successive shocks of earthquakes, which toppled down various houses and made the old Moslem towers rock to their foundation. Many, many years then rolled away, during which Granada was rarely honored by a royal guest. The palace of the nobility remained silent and shut up, and the Alhambra, like a slighted beauty, sat in mournful desolation among her neglected gardens. The tower of the Infantas, once the residence of the three beautiful Moorish princesses, partook of the general desolation, and the spider spun her web athwart the gilded vault, and bats and owls nestled in those chambers that had been graced by the presence of Zaida, Zoraida, and Zorohaida. The neglect of the tower may partly have been owing to some superstitious notions of the neighbors. It was rumored that the spirit of the youthful Zorahida, who had perished in that tower, was often seen by moonlight, seated beside the fountain in the hall, or moaning about the battlements, and that the notes of her silver lute would be heard at midnight by wayfarers passing along the glen. At length, the city of Granada was once more enlivened by the royal presence. All the world knows that Philip V was the first Bourbon that swayed the Spanish sceptre. All the world knows that he married, in second nuptials, Elizabetta or Isabella, for they are the same, the beautiful princess of Parma. And all the world knows that by this chain of contingencies a French prince and an Italian princess were seated together on the Spanish throne. For the reception of this illustrious pair, the Alhambra was repaired and fitted up with all possible expedition. The arrival of the court changed the whole aspect of the lately deserted place. The clangor of drum and trumpet, the tramp of steed about the avenues and outer court, the glitter of arms and display of banners about barbican and battlement recalled the ancient and warlike glories of the fortress. A softer spirit, however, reigned within the royal palace. There was the rustling of robes and the cautious tread and murmuring voice of reverential courtiers about the antechambers, a loitering of pages and maids of honor about the gardens, and the sound of music stealing from open casements. Among those who attended in the train of the monarchs was a favorite page of the queen named Ruiz de Alacon. To say that he was a favorite page of the queen was at once to speak his eulogium, for every one in the suite of the stately Elizabetta was chosen for grace and beauty and accomplishments. He was just turned of eighteen, light and little of form, and graceful as a young Antinous. To the queen he was all deference and respect, yet he was at heart a roguish stripling, petted and spoiled by the ladies about the court, and experienced in the ways of women far beyond his years. This loitering page was one morning rambling about the groves of the Henrelief, which overlooked the grounds of the Alhambra. He had taken with him for his amusement a favorite gerfalcon of the queen. In the course of his rambles, seeing a bird rising from a thicket, he unhooded the hawk and let him fly. The falcon towered high in the air, made a swoop at his quarry, but missing it, soared away regardless of the calls of the page. The latter followed the truant bird with his eye in its capricious flight, until he saw it alight upon the battlements of a remote and lonely tower in the outer wall of the Alhambra, built on the edge of a ravine that separated the royal fortress from the grounds of the Henrelief. It was, in fact, the tower 
of the princesses. The page descended into the ravine and approached the tower, but it had no entrance from the glen, and its lofty height rendered any attempt to scale it fruitless. Seeking one of the gates of the fortress, therefore, he made a wide circuit to that side of the tower facing within the walls. A small garden enclosed by a trellis-work of reeds overhung with myrtle lay before the tower. Opening a wicket, the page passed between beds of flowers and thickets of roses to the door. It was closed and bolted. A crevice in the door gave him a peep into the interior. There was a small Moorish hall with fretted walls, light marble columns, and an alabaster fountain surrounded with flowers. In the center hung a gilt cage containing a singing bird. Beneath it, on a chair, lay a tortoise-shell cat among reels of silk and other articles of female labor, and a guitar, decorated with ribbons, leaned against the fountain. Ruiz de Alacon was struck with these traces of female taste and elegance in a lonely and, as he had supposed, deserted tower. They reminded him of the tales of enchanted halls, current in the Alhambra, and the tortoise-shell cat might be some spellbound princess. He knocked gently at the door, a beautiful face peeped out from a little window above, but was instantly withdrawn. He waited, expecting that the door would be opened, but he waited in vain. No footstep was to be heard within, all was silent. Had his senses deceived him, or was this beautiful apparition the fairy of the tower? He knocked again, and more loudly. After a little while the beaming face once more peeped forth. It was that of a blooming damsel of fifteen. The page immediately doffed his plumed bonnet, and entreated in the most courteous accents to be permitted to ascend the tower in pursuit of his falcon. "'I dare not open the door, signor,' replied the little damsel, blushing. "'My aunt has forbidden it. I do beseech you, fair maid. It is the favorite falcon of the queen. I dare not return to the palace without it. Are you, then, one of the cavaliers of the court? I am, fair maid, but I shall lose the queen's favor and my place if I lose this hawk. Santa Maria, it is against you cavaliers of the court that my aunt has charged me especially to bar the door against wicked cavaliers doubtless but i am none of those but a simple harmless page who will be ruined and undone if you deny me this small request the heart of the little damsel was touched by the distress of the page it was a thousand pities he should be ruined for the want of so trifling a boon surely too he could not be one of those dangerous beings whom her aunt had described as a species of cannibal, ever on the prowl, to make prey of thoughtless damsels. He was gentle and modest, and stood so entreatingly with cap in hand, and looked so charming. The sly page saw that the garrison began to waver, and redoubled his entreaties in such moving terms that it was not in the nature of mortal maiden to deny him. So the blushing little warder of the tower descended and opened the door with a trembling hand, and if the page had been charmed by a mere glimpse of her countenance from the window, he was ravished by the full-length portrait now revealed to him. Her Andalusian bodice and trim basquina set off the round but delicate symmetry of her form, which was as yet scarce verging into womanhood. Her glossy hair was parted on her forehead with scrupulous exactness, and decorated with a fresh plucked rose according to the universal custom of the country. It is true her complexion was tinged by the ardor of a southern sun, but it served to give richness to the mantling bloom of her cheek, and to heighten the luster of her melting eyes. Ruiz de Alacon beheld all this with a single glance, for it became him not to tarry. He merely murmured his acknowledgments, 
and then bounded lightly up the spiral staircase in quest of his falcon. He soon returned with the truant bird upon his fist. The damsel, in the meantime, had seated herself by the fountain in the hall, and was winding silk. But in her agitation she let fall the reel upon the pavement. The page sprang, picked it up, then dropping gracefully on one knee, presented it to her, but seizing the hand extended to receive it, imprinted on it a kiss more fervent and devout than he had ever imprinted on the fair hand of his sovereign. Ave Maria, Signor! exclaimed the damsel, blushing still deeper with confusion and surprise, for never before had she received such a salutation. The modest page made a thousand apologies, assuring her it was the way, at court, of expressing the most profound homage and respect. Her anger, if anger she felt, was easily pacified, but her agitation and embarrassment continued, and she sat blushing deeper and deeper, with her eyes cast down upon her work, entangling the silk which she attempted to wind. The cunning page saw the confusion in the opposite camp, and would fain have profited by it, but the fine speeches he would have uttered died upon his lips. His attempts at gallantry were awkward and ineffectual, and to his surprise the adroit page, who had figured with such grace and effrontery among the most knowing and experienced ladies of the court, found himself awed and abashed in the presence of a simple damsel of fifteen. In fact, the artless maiden, in her own modesty and innocence, had guardians more effectual than the bolts and bars prescribed by her vigilant aunt. Still, where is the female bosom proof against the first whisperings of love? The little damsel, with all her artlessness, instinctively comprehended all that the faltering tongue of the page failed to express, and her heart was fluttered at beholding, for the first time, a lover at her feet, and such a lover. The diffidence of the page, though genuine, was short-lived, and he was recovering his usual ease and confidence when a shrill voice was heard at a distance. My aunt is returning from mass, cried the damsel in a fright. I pray you, Signor, depart. Not until you grant me that rose from your hair as a remembrance. She hastily untwisted the rose from her raven locks. Take it, cried she, agitated and blushing, but pray be gone. The page took the rose, and at the same time covered with kisses the fair hand that gave it. Then, placing the flower in his bonnet, and taking the falcon upon his fist, he bounded off through the garden, bearing away with him the heart of the gentle Jacinta. When the vigilant aunt arrived at the tower, she remarked the agitation of her niece, and an air of confusion in the hall. But a word of explanation sufficed. A gerfalcon had pursued his prey into the hall. Mercy on us! to think of a falcon flying into the tower. Did ever one hear of so saucy a hawk? Why, the very bird in the cage is not safe. The vigilant Fredegonda was one of the most wary of ancient spinsters. She had a becoming terror and distrust of what she denominated the opposite sex, which had gradually increased through a long life of celibacy. Not that the good lady had ever suffered from their wiles, nature having set up a safeguard in her face that forbade all trespass upon her premises. But ladies who have least cause to fear for themselves are most ready to keep a watch over their more tempting neighbors. The niece was the orphan of an officer who had fallen in the wars. She had been educated in a convent, and had recently been transferred from her sacred asylum to the immediate guardianship of her aunt, under whose overshadowing care she vegetated in obscurity 
like an opening rose blooming beneath a briar. Nor, indeed, is this comparison entirely accidental, for, to tell the truth, her fresh and dawning beauty had caught the public eye, even in her seclusion, and, with that poetical turn common to the people of Andalusia, the peasantry of the neighborhood had given her the appellation of the Rose of the Alhambra. The wary aunt continued to keep a faithful watch over her tempting little niece, as long as the court continued at Granada, and flattered herself that her vigilance had been successful. It is true, the good lady was now and then discomposed by the tinkling of guitars and chanting of love ditties from the moonlit groves beneath the tower, but she would exhort her niece to shut her ears against such idle minstrelsy, assuring her that it was one of the arts of the opposite sex, by which simple maids were often lured to their undoing. Alas, what chance with a simple maid has a dry lecture against a moonlight serenade? At length King Philip cut short his sojourn in Granada, and suddenly departed with all his train. The vigilant Fredegonda watched the royal pageant as it issued forth from the gate of justice, and descended the great avenue leading to the city. When the last banner disappeared from her sight, she returned exulting to her tower, for all her cares were over. To her surprise, a light Arabian steed pawed the ground at the wicket gate of the garden. To her horror, she saw through the thickets of roses a youth in gaily embroidered dress at the feet of her niece. At the sound of her footsteps, he gave a tender adieu, bounded lightly over the barrier of reeds and myrtles, sprang upon his horse, and was out of sight in an instant. The tender Jacinta, in the agony of her grief, lost all thought of her aunt's displeasure. Throwing herself into her arms, she broke forth into sobs and tears. Ay, de me, cried she, he is gone, he is gone, and I shall never see him more. Gone? Who is gone? What youth is this I saw at your feet? A queen's page, aunt, who came to bid me farewell. A queen's page, child, echoed the vigilant Fredegonda faintly, and when did you become acquainted with a queen's page? The morning that the gerfalcon flew into the tower, it was the queen's gerfalcon, and he came in pursuit of it. Ah, silly, silly girl, know that there are no gerfalcons half so dangerous as those prankling pages and it is precisely such simple birds as thee that they pounce upon. The aunt was at first indignant at learning that, in despite of her boasted vigilance, a tender intercourse had been carried on by the youthful lovers almost beneath her eye. But when she found that her simple-hearted niece, though thus exposed, without the protection of bolt or bar to all the machinations of the opposite sex, had come forth unsinged from the fiery ordeal, she consoled herself with the persuasion that it was owing to the chaste and cautious maxims in which she had, as it were, steeped her to the very lips. While the aunt laid this soothing unction to her pride, the niece treasured up the oft-repeated vows of fidelity of the page. But what is the love of restless roving man? A vagrant stream that dallies for a time with each flower upon its banks, then passes on and leaves them all in tears. Days, weeks, months elapsed, and nothing more was heard of the page. The pomegranate ripened, the vine yielded up its fruit, the autumnal rains descended in torrents from the mountains, the Sierra Nevada became covered with a snowy mantle, and wintry blasts howled through the halls of the Alhambra. Still he came not. The winter passed away. Again the genial spring burst forth with song 
and blossoms and balmy zephyr. The snows melted from the mountains, until none remained but on the lofty summit of the Nevada, glistening through the sultry summer air. Still nothing was heard of the forgetful page. In the meantime, the poor little Jacinta grew pale and thoughtful. Her former occupations and amusements were abandoned. Her silk lay entangled, her guitar unstrung, her flowers were neglected, the notes of her bird unheeded, and her eyes, once so bright, were dimmed with secret weeping. If any solitude could be devised to foster the passion of a lovelorn damsel, it would be such a place as the Alhambra, where every thing seems disposed to produce tender and romantic reveries. It is a very paradise for lovers. How hard, then, to be alone in such a paradise, and not merely alone, but forsaken. Alas, silly child, would the staid and immaculate Fredonda say, when she found her niece in one of her desponding moods, did I not warn thee against the wiles and deceptions of these men? What couldst thou expect, too, from one of a haughty and aspiring family, thou, an orphan, the descendant of a fallen and impoverished line? Be assured, if the youth were true, his father, who is one of the proudest nobles about the court, would prohibit his union with one so humble and portionless as thou. Pluck up thy resolution, therefore, and drive these idle notions from thy mind. The words of the immaculate Fredegunda only served to increase the melancholy of her niece, but she sought to indulge it in private. At a late hour one summer night, after her aunt had retired to rest, she remained alone in the hall of the tower, seated beside the alabaster fountain. It was here that the faithless page had first knelt and kissed her hand. It was here that he had often vowed eternal fidelity. The poor little damsel's heart was overladen with sad and tender recollections. Her tears began to flow, and slowly fell, drop by drop, into the fountain. By degrees the crystal water became agitated, and bubble, 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 boiled up and was tossed about until a female figure, richly clad in Moorish robes, slowly rose to view. Jacinta was so frightened that she fled from the hall and did not venture to return. The next morning she related what she had seen to her aunt, but the good lady treated it as a fantasy of her troubled mind, or supposed she had fallen asleep and dreamt beside the fountain. Thou hast been thinking of the story of the three Moorish princesses that once inhabited the tower, continued she, and it has entered into thy dreams. What story, aunt? I know nothing of it. Thou hast certainly heard of the three princesses, Zaida, Zoraida, and Zorahida, who were confined in this tower by the king, their father, and agreed to fly with three Christian cavaliers. The first two accomplished their escape, but the third failed in resolution, and remained, and, it is said, died in this tower. I now recollect to have heard of it, said Jacinta, and to have wept over the fate of the gentle Zorahida. Thou mayest well weep over her fate, continued the aunt, for the lover of Zorahida was thy ancestor. He long bemoaned his Moorish love, but time cured him of his grief, and he married a Spanish lady from whom thou art descended. Jacinta ruminated upon these words that what I have seen is no fantasy of the brain, she said to herself, I am confident. If indeed it be the sprite of the gentle Zorahida, which I have heard lingers about this tower, of what should I be afraid? I'll watch by the fountain to-night. Perhaps the visit will be repeated. Towards midnight, when everything was quiet, she again 
took her seat in the hall. As the bell on the distant watch-tower of the Alhambra struck the midnight hour, the fountain was again agitated, and bubble, 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 it tossed about the waters until the Moorish female again rose to view. She was young and beautiful, her dress was rich with jewels, and in her hand she held a silver lute. Jacinta trembled and was faint, but was reassured by the soft and plaintive voice of the apparition, and the sweet expression of her pale melancholy countenance. "'Daughter of mortality,' said she, "'what aileth thee? Why do thy tears trouble my fountain, and thy sighs and plaints disturb the quiet watches of the night? I weep because of the faithlessness of man, and I bemoan my solitary and forsaken state. Take comfort, thy sorrows may yet have an end. Thou beholdest a Moorish princess, who like thee was unhappy in her love. A Christian knight, thy ancestor, won my heart, and would have borne me to his native land, and to the bosom of his church. I was a convert in my heart, but I lacked courage equal to my faith, and lingered till too late. For this the evil genii are permitted to have power over me, and I remain enchanted in this tower until some pure Christian will deign to break the magic spell. Wilt thou undertake the task? I will, replied the damsel, trembling. Come hither, then, and fear not. Dip thy hand in the fountain, sprinkle the water over me, and baptize me after the manner of thy faith. So shall the enchantment be dispelled, and my troubled spirit have repose. The damsel advanced with faltering steps, dipped her hand in the fountain, collected water in the palm, and sprinkled it over the pale face of the phantom. The latter smiled with ineffable benignity. She dropped her silver lute at the feet of Jacinta, crossed her white arms upon her bosom, and melted from sight, so that it seemed merely as if a shower of dewdrops had fallen into the fountain. Jacinta retired from the hall, filled with awe and wonder. She scarcely closed her eyes that night, but when she awoke at daybreak, out of a troubled slumber, the whole appeared to her like a distempered dream. On descending into the hall, however, the truth of the vision was established, for beside the fountain she beheld the silver lute glittering in the morning sunshine. She hastened to her aunt, related all that had befallen her, and called her to behold the lute as a testimonial of the reality of her story. If the good lady had any lingering doubts, they were removed when Jacinta touched the instrument, for she drew forth such ravishing tones as to thaw even the frigid bosom of the immaculate Fredahonda, that region of eternal winter, into a genial flow. Nothing but supernatural melody could have produced such an effect. The extraordinary power of the lute became every day more and more apparent. The wayfarer passing by the tower was detained and, as it were, spellbound in breathless ecstasy. The very birds gathered in the neighboring trees, and, hushing their own strains, listened in charmed silence. Rumor soon spread the news abroad. The inhabitants of Granada thronged to the Alhambra to catch a few notes of the transcendent music that floated about the tower of Las Infantas. The lovely little minstrel was at length drawn forth from her retreat. The rich and powerful of the land contended who should entertain and do honor to her, or rather, who should secure the charms of her lute to draw fashionable throngs to their salons. Wherever she went, her vigilant aunt kept a dragon-watch at her elbow, awing the throngs of impassioned admirers who hung in raptures on her strains. 
the report of her wonderful powers spread from city to city malaga seville cordova all became successively mad on the theme nothing was talked of throughout andalusia but the beautiful minstrel of the alhambra how could it be otherwise among a people so musical and gallant as the andalusians when the lute was magical in its powers and the minstrel inspired by love while all andalusia was thus music mad a different mood prevailed at the court of spain philip v as is well known was a miserable hypochondriac and subject to all kinds of fancies sometimes he would keep to his bed for weeks together groaning under imaginary complaints at other times he would insist upon abdicating his throne to the great annoyance of his royal spouse who had a strong relish for the splendours of a court and the glories of a crown and guided the sceptre of her imbecile lord with an expert and steady hand nothing was found to be so efficacious in dispelling the royal megrims as the powers of music the queen took care therefore to have the best performers both vocal and instrumental at hand and retained the famous italian singer farinelli about the court as a kind of royal physician at the moment we treat of however a freak had come over the mind of this sapient and illustrious bourbon that surpassed all former vagaries after a long spell of imaginary illness which set all the strains of farinelli and the consultations of a whole orchestra of court fiddlers at defiance the monarch fairly in idea gave up the ghost and considered himself absolutely dead this would have been harmless enough and even convenient both to his queen and courtiers had he been content to remain in the quietude befitting a dead man but to their annoyance he insisted upon having the funeral ceremonies performed over him and to their inexpressible perplexity began to grow impatient and to revile bitterly at them for negligence and disrespect in leaving him unburied what was to be done to disobey the king's positive commands was monstrous in the eyes of the obsequious courtiers of a punctilious court but to obey him and bury him alive would be downright regicide in the midst of this fearful dilemma a rumour reached the court of the female minstrel who was turning the brains of all andalusia the queen dispatched missives in all haste to summon her to san ildefonso where the court at that time resided within a few days as the queen with her maids of honour was walking in these stately gardens intended with their avenues and terraces and fountains to eclipse the glories of versailles the far-famed minstrel was conducted into her presence the imperial elizabetta gazed with surprise at the youthful and unpretending appearance of the little being that had set the world madding she was in her picturesque andalusian dress her silver lute was in her hand and she stood with modest and downcast eyes but with a simplicity and freshness of beauty that still bespoke her the rose of the alhambra as usual she was accompanied by her ever vigilant fredegonda who gave the whole history of her parentage and descent to the inquiring queen if the stately elizabetta had been interested by the appearance of jacinta she was still more pleased when she learnt that she was of a meritorious though impoverished line and that her father had bravely fallen in the service of the crown if thy powers equal their renown said she and thou canst cast forth this evil spirit that possesses thy sovereign thy fortune shall henceforth be my care and honours and wealth attend thee impatient to make trial of her skill she led the way at once to the apartment of the moody monarch jacinta followed with downcast eyes through files of guards and crowds of courtiers 
they arrived at length at a great chamber hung in black. The windows were closed to exclude the light of day. A number of yellow wax tapers in silver sconces diffused a lugubrious light, and dimly revealed the figures of mutes in mourning dresses, and courtiers who glided about with noiseless step and woe-begone visage. On the midst of a funeral bed or bier, his hands folded on his breast, and the tip of his nose just visible, lay extended this would-be buried monarch. The queen entered the chamber in silence, and, pointing to a footstool in an obscure corner, beckoned to Jacinta to sit down and commence. At first she touched her lute with a faltering hand, but gathering confidence and animation as she proceeded, drew forth such soft aerial harmony that all present could scarcely believe it mortal. As to the monarch, who had already considered himself in the world of spirits, he set it down for some angelic melody or the music of the spheres. By degrees the theme was varied, and the voice of the minstrel accompanied the instrument. She poured forth one of the legendary ballads treating of the ancient glories of the Alhambra and the achievements of the Moors. Her whole soul entered into the theme, for with the recollections of the Alhambra was associated the story of her love. The funereal chamber resounded with the animating strain. It entered into the gloomy heart of the monarch. He raised his head and gazed around. He sat up on his couch. His eyes began to kindle. At length, leaping upon the floor, he called for sword and buckler. The triumph of music, or rather of the enchanted lute, was complete. The demon of melancholy was cast forth, and as it were a dead man brought to life. The windows of the apartment were thrown open, the glorious effulgence of Spanish sunshine burst into the late lugubrious chamber. All eyes sought the lovely enchantress, but the lute had fallen from her hand. She had sunk upon the earth, and the next moment was clasped to the bosom of Ruiz de Alacon. The nuptials of the happy couple were shortly after celebrated with great splendor. But hold, I hear the reader ask, how did Ruiz de Alacon account for his long neglect? Oh, that was all owing to the opposition of a proud, pragmatical old father. Besides, young people, who really like one another, soon come to an amicable understanding, and bury all past grievances whenever they meet. But how was the proud, pragmatical old father reconciled to the match? Oh, his scruples were easily overruled by a word or two from the queen, especially as dignities and rewards were showered upon the blooming favorite of royalty. Besides, the lute of Jacinta, you know, possessed a magic power and could control the most stubborn head and hardest heart. And what became of the enchanted lute? Oh, that is the most curious matter of all, and plainly proves the truth of all the story. That lute remained for some time in the family, but was purloined and carried off as was supposed by the great singer Farinelli, in pure jealousy. At his death it passed into other hands in Italy, who were ignorant of its mystic powers, and, melting down the silver, transferred the strings to an old Cremona fiddle. The strings still retain something of their magic virtues. A word in the reader's ear, but let it go no further. That fiddle, is now bewitching the whole world. It is the fiddle of Paganini. End of chapter 25